Okay, we play? All right. Let me uh, begin with a reflection. The Greeks were the first to develop a metaphysics. That's a strange word, metaphysics. Let me talk about it for a few minutes. Let us say there is a range of human experience from the most common experiences, sight, hearing, <clears throat> let's call that the realm of the senses. Then there's common sense. Everyday understanding Oh, then, unusual experiences, aesthetic experiences. Uh, above that, there's another kind of experience, more profound. We can call that the more profound experiences. And above that, let us make another, another category and call it that open to the mystical or the philosophical. Now, metaphysics is nothing other than a way of understanding this realm. That's all it is. It's creating a language and creating images to render intelligible the profound experiences of man. Sometimes they're called peak experiences. And so over the years, there's been a thousand years of development of Platonic thought. That development of Platonic thought had as its goal to make intelligible man's most profound experiences. That's the goal of metaphysics, nothing else. Now, the difficulty in getting into metaphysics in the modern world is that it's somewhat difficult to go around the corner and get a mystical experience. Hmm. Difficult. Even if you try drugs, it's not certain. <laughs> so therefore, there's a whole way of talking and understanding about things that are most profound. And for most of us, we can't get into it. We can study it, we can memorize it, we can talk about it. But its primary purpose is to render intelligible this. So that can be used as a springboard to something yet higher. And that's the real goal. Well, if there's something higher than that, and it's difficult to get to this, then that is going to be even more remote and rare. And that's the higher part of metaphysics. But there's a way around it. There's a way around it. And that's what I would like to point to. This language to understand these experiences, it's a specialized language and it's called metaphysics. This special language Is really and really can be used to understand your own experiences and to render intelligible your dream world. Now that's rather curious, you see. This is a different way of looking at the dream world. How are we going to show that? That's where we're going. It's going to take four weeks and maybe a retreat. I just came back from a retreat up in Esalen. We did this for a week. Now, what do I mean by saying that to render intelligible 
the dream world, we will use the language of metaphysics. Well, that means first that we'll have to see what is meant by the dream world. We want to talk about its structure. We want to see what figures, images it uses. We want to take a look at the structure of dreams and the figure and images and the meaning of dreams. We want to look at that and ask ourselves what created it. If we can study the structure and the figures and the images of the dream and reach a level of meaning, personal, personal meaning, then dreams are intelligible. Now, if dreams are only personally intelligible, if they only have a personal message, then the, the creator of dreams is just some extension of ourselves and it's only limited to ourselves. But if there is a more profound aspect to what created it, let's even build to it. If we can see that what created it is itself, transcendent and imminent and in the highest sense wise or reveals something called wisdom then we can use that as a bridge and bring in the stuff called metaphysics and you know what you'll see you'll see that you'll be able to use a metaphysics to understand what creates dreams from your own dreams. And what will that do? That will allow you to find a language in metaphysics that you can then easily use and verify for yourself since it's your own dream and see that you are in fact or have within you, or share, or participate in, something that is indeed intelligible, profound, and can anticipate the mystical. That's where we're going. Okay, that's where we're going. So I thought I'd introduce it, give you the whole thing all at once. Now, a couple of words to play. This talk is about philosophical midwifery and dreams. Now, what a strange and unusual word that is, philosophical midwife. I mean, people are going to come here thinking that we're talking about local midwives who are philosophical, but that's not what we mean. Socrates called himself a philosophical midwife because his mother was a great midwife. And he said, just as my mother assists those in labor and travail and helps them bring to birth? He says, so do I. Help men who are pregnant with ideas. And so I help them come to birth with their ideas. And they go through what appears to be a parallel process, psychologically. Well, he goes on to say that not only is he a philosophical midwife that can assist those who are laboring with ideas, I have something else I do, he said, that's the hallmark of my art and my mother's art. Before every midwife must judge the birth, what's come to birth, to determine whether it should be aborted or not, whether it's a true and noble birth or not. And therefore, that's a very important part of being a midwife. Well, he's got another aspect which he picked up. He said, as a consequence of being a midwife, the midwife over the years then can easily judge what kinds of couples should come together in order to bring about the, no, the most noble births. And he mentions this in a dialogue called the Theotetus. He says, I'm somewhat ashamed to mention this in public. He said, because that's a pimp. <laughs> Arranging. He says, so I don't want to mention that in public, he says. But he says, that's actually the very high art of philosophical midwife midwifery, 
to be able to see what kinds of relationships are meaningful and that will help bring to birth something significant. He said, I can tell what kind of relationships would be successful, for in those kinds of relationships, something may emerge that is significant and worth nurturing and developing. The child of such relationships, he claims, is the very goal of the relationship. Is every relationship, something must give, something must come to birth. And that must be developed and nurtured. If not, it's sterile. And the whole question then is what kinds of things most ideally come to birth in relationships? And that is a curious thing, a communion with ideas. Right? Because by interrelating, you then see yourself and the other and they and you, and therefore there's a new thing that develops and that new thing is a growth and development of ideas, personal ideas, private ideas. So that's philosophical midwifery. So I'm the philosophical midwife. I've been playing this game for many, many years. Now, what are we going to say with it? We're going to say, you know what? Fundamental idea I'm going to bring to you is very simple. Man is a knower. Man wants to know. Now look here, this is a model for learning. It's simple, we're all aware of it, and that's why it's going to be important, because we're going to vary it. And later we have to relate it to the dream, don't we? So first, when there is a teacher or plays the role of teacher, something must be transmitted, must be explicit. The student must be receptive and open to it. Questions are tolerated and encouraged, and whatever then is learned must be tested. The information is general enough to be applied to many circumstances and situations. Therefore, as the learner then has mastered the material, they can then apply it to the universe and in that application seek goals. That's learning. Now, notice, it's explicit, it's put into words, it's all in words. It may require some kind of performance as well, whether you're studying music, art, science, literature, it's all this, is it not? Ah, next one. Now there's another kind of learning. This is a curious one, indeed. For man is also not only a knower, but a believer. And it's the clash between the two. That's the very nature of the conflict that's going to be represented in dreams. Now, notice the difference between the two. First, in order to play with this theme, consider your own lives. Right, consider your own lives. Raised by your, your parents, authorities, guardians. At some point, at some point, they must reveal to you what they personally think about you and the universe. Now, it's those times that are most significant because they might do it only when they're angry, when they're upset, when they face defeat, death, sorrow, levels of intensity. But what they do though, right, at these moments, is they want to pass something on. Something, some teaching about two things. About you, yourself, and they want to pass something about what they perceive as the nature of reality. The world. That's what they want to do. And so, 
they're going to wait for a time when you're open and passive and receptive and there's no conflicts and they're going to appear strong sincere knowing revealing sharing and you're going to look at them and you're going to say by heavens that's rare they're coming out for me they're communicating themselves they're sharing they're communicating they think enough of me to reveal to me what they secretly think about me and the universe. Wow! The whole attention is focused on you at that time. You're open and receptive. And now the teaching comes in. It's personal. It's a function of their own existence and their own lives. Now what's interesting about that is whatever comes to you at that moment, you have, you have a whole history up to this point. Many things that have happened to you and the family and all the world around you. Now, invariably, there's going to be a conflict between what they're going to be transmitting to you and your own experience. Now, it must be a conflict. It has to be a conflict. You know why? Because no one's so smart as to be able to tell you about yourself and the nature of reality. That's all. Whatever they say is going to be wrong. Whatever they say at this moment is going to be wrong. It doesn't make any difference. It's just a matter of to what degree they're wrong. So when you're open and receptive and they get upset and they yell at you and they tell you you're a this or that, it doesn't matter. Whatever it is they communicate, with a smile or a frown, anger or in terror, it's not going to be true. But it's going to be the birth of something from themselves and what they in turn have had passed on to them. And that's essential. So here you see the authority now you're in an open, passive, receptive state, and they're now going to reveal something about you and your rea and reality. Now, it need not be, it can be verbal, but it doesn't need to be verbal. They can do it in a number of ways, dramatically. But then this is the transmission of a family lineage, a family teaching. No questioning, no testing. It's always to you, it's always particular, it's always private, it's always rare. So let me ask you. You can even come up right now with an image. Consider when your own parents in your youth appeared strong, sincere, knowing, revealing, sharing with you. Think of any, any past scene at all. What did they say? What did they do? How did they communicate to you? That's the transmission of a belief. That's a transmission of a belief. Do you have one? Did one come up? Did one come? What's yours? What one came up for you? To my Louder? I was sitting talking to my father. Okay, let's do it. Okay. Thank you, first of all, for sharing it. Okay, look here. I happen to be very good at people sitting, drawing <laughs> pictures of sitting. Go. All right, we're standing. He's standing. You're both sitting. Okay, where? In the kitchen. Okay, I'm also good at drawing kitchens. So Go ahead. And looking at the um, that great thing. Okay. At, while this is going on, you're both looking at TV. Go ahead. Yeah, and it was, it, it's okay. it was distant. 
long distance. Okay, thank you. But it was on, and it was in that direction, but we were talking, and he was letting me know um, what his um, image of my mother was. Good. I'll tell you a secret. Yeah. Hey? I'm going to tell you something about your reality, all right? I'll tell you something about your mother. Come about the world. About the world. What? Could you reveal it? Could you share it? Um, she doesn't know what she's doing most of the time. Go ahead. Go ahead. And that uh, the world is um, always out to get you. And if you are part of a certain group of people, they get into dog fights. Are those the... Uh, the yeah, the accomplished. Okay. Those that succeed? They're accomplish? Pardon? They're always at each other's throat. Pardon? They're each other's throat. What? They're at each other's throat. Therefore, they're savage. Yeah. Right? They're savage. Right? How did he appear at that time? Oh, it was very, um, it seemed real. How often did, did he appear this way? This real? Well, I never, hardly ever got to see him because he was rarely at home because of his work. But these would, they were mostly on the weekend. Okay. In fact, the, about the only time was on weekends. Okay. And outside of other times, this was unusual. Okay. I mean, I related to him on the weekends, but not this way. Yeah, so it's rare. Now look, you see, when that happens, that's not the trans... That's not... See, that's the transmission of certain beliefs, but that's not the one. That's not the one we're after. The one we're going to be after is this one. Now she's going to walk away. You're going to walk away from this scene and you're going to say to yourself, what? Mother doesn't know what she's doing? The world is out to get you? Anyone who accomplishes anything? Dog eat dog? It's savage out there? Now you make a conclusion. That's the one. So you make a conclusion, and you don't know the conclusion you made. You form an impression as you walk away. Huh? Now the reason you're not going to make a conclusion in words is that it's pretty dangerous to do so. Because, look here, you have to make a decision, you have to make a conclusion, either about what he is doing at that moment, or you're going to believe him. You're either going to have to make a judgment about why he's doing what he's doing and put a name on it, or you're going to believe him and you're going to come to some, some kind of impression, some kind of conclusion, but it won't be in words and that's the problem. So, you either have to say he's a this or he's a that for doing this, or you believe, or you believe him, and now you have to make some statement about your participation in the world. Now, we're going back to this, you see. You're open, you're receptive, you're passive. A an idea is being transmitted, beliefs are being transmitted. Do you think you can question it at that moment? Go back to Dad and say, hey, Dad, you, I'd like to review that point about Mom. She doesn't know what she's doing. You know, she happens to be this and that. She does this rather well, and she's done this. Lived in the world many years, you know. I mean, do you really want to say she doesn't know what she's doing? Uh, Dad, uh, you sure everyone's out to, uh, everyone out there is savage, and everyone who's successful will just are at one another's throats, Dad? Is this, is this your experience? Is it true? I'm dead. Can you ask questions? Could you test it? 
Uh oh, to test it assumes that you think it may be false. But if you're going to do either one of those things, then you're saying something about him. Now look here. You're going to end up with a puzzle. Puzzle is, is that true? Now, what follows, what follows? This whole scene has been created, convincing as he can be. Would you agree that these ideas are important in the family? Let me put it in another way. Does this explain something about his life? Does this explain perhaps his own success and failures? If the world is like this, what follows? He's confiding in you. He's telling you something, isn't he? Does that make sense of a lot of experience in the household? You see, it makes sense of a lot of things that have been going on over many years that you couldn't put together. Now you know. Hey, Dad, Dad if Dad's right, if Dad's right, and he certainly looks right, does that make sense then of the universe, your family? Oh. Why he acted the way he did. Yeah. See, these fundamental beliefs make sense of the whole background of the family. It makes sense. It makes intelligible. That's what we call the milieu, the background. It makes sense of a lot of things that were disturbing and puzzling. Now look here. <laughs> Let me ask you. Look here. Here we go now. Here he is. He's passing this on with the, all of these great, beautiful states of mind. He's, right there they are. Look at that. Isn't that a great state of mind he's in? To doubt that and to challenge that would be challenging the way he appears at his greatest moment. Okay, now is it possible then that this belief, now you find yourself at a situation where all right, you now want to achieve something that's important to you. And these are the steps leading up to your goal. Now, if you've accepted this belief, you don't even know you've accepted it. But if you do accept it, do you think that might create a problem? Because now that you're trying to get your goal, is it likely that you'll be wondering about whether or not it's worth it? Would it? Does it? Yep. Now, does that rob you? Does it rob the person of some vitality, some energy in this pursuit? Does it set them up for a failure and a defeat? Because, look here, what would follow if you were to go ahead and gain your goal and then go back and have a nice talk with Dad? His philosophy is now on the line. If you're right, then he's wrong, and he's wrong about his whole life, and all the implications of that wherever they go in the family. That's a loaded discussion, isn't it? Or he may not even show up. <laughs> now look here, see. <laughs> From these situations then, right? We do something very good. We combine the two, man the knower, man the believer. We combine them both. So as you pursue your goal, you bump into an obstacle. Whatever obstacle and block you've had in your life, it's very, very likely that it's cyclical. That means it's happened in the past again and again and again and again. And some features, therefore, of this cyclical problem you've had is very likely to be traced back to that very teaching. 
So what does that mean? It means this, you see. Here is the explicit. Here's the teacher. He passes on to you the teaching. Then you in turn become a teacher or apply it in the universe as you seek your goals. But not understanding this, not being prepared for this, these two, this is the knower in you and this is the believer in you. And so now as you now apply this to your goal, something curious comes in. You forget entirely about the fact that the obstacles and the difficulties you've encountered arrive once more. You forget entirely that you've been here before cyclically again and again and again. And amnesia sets in. And therefore you forget entirely the richness of your past and you apply blindly the teaching. So the knowing is goal related the belief is failure related. And the way they combine produces the cycles of our disasters. Now the way to understand problems and to work through them is called philosophical midwifery. Now if we were to take the young lady here all right. and say, all right, let's take a particular situation and see how this has played itself out. Let's find out when it did it, specifically, particularly. Let's see what state of mind you were in. Let's see what kinds of thoughts and, and feelings occurred at that time. Let's trace it out in great detail and see whether or not this teaching isn't playing a major role. If it's playing a major role towards compromising, now there are three ways you can compromise on your goal or lose your goal. The best one is you can get it and depreciate it. Consider it secondary. Don't nurture it. Don't develop it and therefore you lose it. The other way of failing is you can approach it, get angry, get angry over the fact that you're getting close to your goal and give it up in anger. That's a failure. I like the third one. You can say, it's not me, it's the world. The world is screwed. It's not me. Blame the world. Get angry at the world because the world didn't do this or that. Because that's part of the great teaching. So there are three ways you can fail. Right? You can get it, depreciate it, not nurture it and develop it. You can have a legitimate failure, right? A failure that matches this very model. Or you can blame the world for all your disasters and say it's not you and therefore you can remain innocent to the world, which must play some role in some past teaching. So, that's the background for where we're going. Yes, sir? Is, is the blame worthiness? Is the blame worthiness? Yeah, that third, that third is blame worthiness always part of False belief. Yes. Of yeah. The yeah. World, of course. Of course. We were saying the world is just, the world is good, not false. See, that's quite right, you see, because this way of understanding things will show that you have to have the problem you have. You have to have the problem you have, and you have to act the way you're acting, because it's perfectly appropriate given your background. Now the only interesting question is, do you want to change it? It's like looking at this chalk, 
you know, and saying, hey, look how dented it is and ill-shaped it's become. Pieces have fallen off. It's no longer perfect. You could say the same thing and say, it's remarkable how this chalk is exactly what it is, precisely because of all the pressures applied to it and all the circumstances that accumulated making it what it is. It's a perfect, this is absolutely perfect being what it is, exactly what it is in the way in which it is. So once you That's see, a problem. So once you see the causes of your predicament, you can see the rationality of things. No, no, see, see, yes, yes and no, see, um, it's not enough to see, you have to test what you see and experience. You have to take the solutions and you have to go out and now struggle and try to achieve that dream. You see, what's interesting about this, this pursuit is the more the goal is personally significant and meaningful to you. The higher the goal, the higher the goal, not practical goals, those aren't enough. Those are trivial in a way. The higher the goal, the more meaningful the goal, the more the basic ideas that we're talking about over here will emerge and manifest themselves. And that's why in this game, the highest ideal is excellence. highest ideal is excellence, in the highest sense. The more the goals are spiritual, the more you're going to see your problem. The more they're meaningful, significant, the more you're going to see your problem. But once you see the difficulty in your problem, what do you have to do? You have to go back and seek that excellence and see whether or not you can now achieve it. That's the knowing, in experience. Understanding isn't enough. Because one of these problems is really so multifaceted like a diamond. There's so many sides to it. You can be amazed at how much clarity you get in understanding your problem. You're still stuck. Because there can be another side to it, another side to it. And parts of it you haven't seen, and so you're still stuck. So therefore you always have to go into experience. And experience is where we grow, where we nurture. But I don't want to minimize, obviously, the role of understanding and insight. But you've got to do something beyond it. Okay, all right? Now, let's play. We're going to do just, I'm going to ask if anyone has a dream of any kind, and we'll take it through if you'd like to take it. You have one? Oh, that was fast. Thank you, first of all. Now, uh, now I didn't take the dream, but I wasn't aware that I was going to be working on a dream tonight. Oh, I good. I can account for the memory, but I did take the dream. So maybe my memory is a dream is better because they actually take this. Uh, so Pardon me, your memory is better than the, no, the recording? The tape, but oh, okay, okay, okay. okay. If you, okay, all right. That's true. That's, that's always true. It's very important. If you're going to do dream work, you must tape. You must tape. And you can test it out easily enough. Tape your dream as soon as you wake up. Matter of fact, you will soon discover that you can wake up after you've had the dream in the middle of the night, tape it. Then in the morning, you'll probably say to yourself, you didn't dream at all. Turn the machine on, you'll be staggered to understand, to, to come kind of think, by heavens, there's one, two. Okay, test it this way, all right? Record, don't listen to it. Then, write it out. Don't read it. Then later, give a verbal expression of the dream. And then, take a look at what you wrote and look at the differences. You'll see amazing and most interesting differences. But, there'll even be more and more interesting differences from the recording. Therefore, since a dream must be looked at in as many images as possible, to the degree that the images are reliable and reflect your actual dream, the more it is and the greater the insight you get from it. So, enough said, all right? Thank you.
Let's play. Yeah, theater. Ah, good. I like theaters. Yes, go right ahead. And uh, I'm looking up at the screen. Pardon me? I'm looking up at the screen. Ah, good. Now, when I look up at the screen, it says something like, you don't belong here. Like, uh, I don't know if it's that. And then over. Pardon me, did you say? I didn't hear I that. Did, I'm sitting there going, so I continue to stay. No, no, me. put words on. I didn't know what to make of. Okay, all right, all right, okay. And then from overhead, my heart's great, from overhead, it? right over my head, there's yeah. a projector. Okay. Yeah, please. And the projector projects a message on, my, on the back of my hand. And the message on Hold the, it. I happen to be good at drawing hands. And the message on the back of my hand was something like, we use human beings for elbow grease. Like a threat. And at that point, I said, you know, this is, I, I, I'm feeling like, well, maybe, maybe I better leave. And as I'm exiting the theater, this young Asian usher, or usher rat, I can't remember, it was, wasn't a threatening person. Uh, guy suggests I go upstairs. Go so, so I go up. Wait a minute. So I'm going up the stairs and down the hallway. Mm -hmm. And I go down this hallway and then to my left, I, I meet this other Asian male. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like one of those 20, 20 year old Vietnamese types. Okay, <laughs> and uh, as we go down the hall to the left, I see what appears to me to be some that are dressed like gangsters. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, I don't feel particularly afraid. It's, it's an unusual environment. But and I keep going, and, and then they open the door at the end, and they step into the shoes warehouse. And the warehouse has all these clothes, you know, hung and hung and hung. It's either a clothing warehouse or a vast dry cleaning establishment. Well, I assume it's a uh, clothing warehouse. It looks to me like a clothing warehouse. That's what I concluded it was. And as soon as I saw that it was a clothing warehouse, I realized that maybe I could have something in common with this, this Asian, Emmer, this Asian guy, because he seems to be an immigrant, gangster type. And I started telling him that my great great grandfather came over, you know, was a Jew from Eastern Europe, and he came over through Canada and started to use cloth, gathered cloth and clothing had a push cart the whole business was in the clothing business. And uh, the family had built that up. And then my grandfather built it up more, so my father lost everything. Mm -hmm. That's it. When you get a dream, you write it down, and you go back over it, and you're looking for states of mind, that's all. What do you do? Look for states of mind. So the easiest way to do it is to go back over it, you see? Remember the first statement? You don't belong here. Yeah. How was that said? What state? If that voice were to come on now, how would you describe it? What kind of state of mind said it's that? Kind of like you don't belong here. I don't know how to explain more than that. It wasn't like the really yelling at me or anything. It was a statement of fact. Someone telling me, uh, you don't belong here. This is, you're on the wrong pew. <laughs> Something like that. You, you don't belong here. 
Well, let's, let's say that's very important, right? You're in the wrong pew. It has that aspect to it. Yeah, right? or something like you're, okay. drunk the, you're drunk at the bar or something, and some nice people go and say you don't belong here, and if you remain, they're going to pick you up and carry you out. So it's a, hidden, it's a kind of threat yeah. behind it. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. And then you throw your hands up, remember that? Well, the projector, well, I didn't just put my hands up. Yeah, yeah, then the projector. I just ignored what I heard. I just yeah. ignored it. Mm -hmm. then this I, saw this in, I saw this threat, another threat, on the top of my hand. Mm -hmm. The image being projected from the light up above. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, and as I was sitting there, I said, you know, if they got this theater, that rig, I remember thinking that, because I I, I didn't take this either, but I remember it now, but I remember thinking in the dream, they've got this place, they, they've got this place in control. I mean, they got the projector, you know, and, uh, and so that, well, for that point, it's not going to leave. That's, you yeah. know, it was like I realized that I was in an environment that was under control of something. Because, I mean, it's this overhead thing that's projected onto my hand. Okay. If it's rigged and if it's controlled, with what kind of atmosphere or... or I didn't belong there. It was like I was out of place. It's different than this, though. Is it the same? There, there was kind of, it was still, it was kind of like a threat again. It was still, All right. you know... Okay. It was kind of like if the subtext was there is uh, we tear people from limb to limb, right? We eat children for breakfast or something like that. We said we use human beings for elbow abuse. Okay. And, but they were, it was kind of like mm -hmm. saying how mean they were. So. Yeah, okay. Then you better leave, remember yeah. that? All right. Yeah. Oh, elbow grease. <laughs> All right. And you went along and you met a Asian usher? Usher. Uh, who suggested I walk up these stairs. Go this she way. seemed uh, like what? How? How did she appear? Oh my God, there's a part of the dream that I put on the tape. I didn't. Okay, go ahead. It's the end of the dream. When I'm in this, when I'm in this empty warehouse, yeah. It's like I'm in this warehouse and I'm also looking down the street. Mm -hmm. And down the street, I see this big house. The big? A big house. Ah, good. Down the street, on the right hand side of the street, this big house. And walking up and down the stairways from the big house are a bunch of Buddhist monks. Yeah, go ahead. And I think in the dream, oh, they're the enforcers. Thank you. That's, that's very helpful. Good, good. With what state now, of mind? I don't mind? remember precisely if that came before I talked about my sorry. past or after. Yeah, okay. yeah, sorry. Sorry. Good. You were going to describe the Vietnamese young lady? Okay. Uh, in, her, in her 20s? Should we just suggest I go this way? Pleasant? Unpleasant? Pleasant. Pleasant? Enough. I didn't feel like I was being threatened. It was just like there was something I was supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so I decided to do it. Mm -hmm. Good, good. Then you went up, went down the hallway, yeah. then you meet the man. Any difference between these two? Huh? Any difference between the male and the female? There seemed to be, or, or it could have been one person, but okay. they changed countenances, the different functions that went through. Okay. Yeah. Now you meet the people that look like gangsters? Yeah, I didn't meet them. I saw them in the room. I mean, they were kind of sitting on a table and stuff. And oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Sitting on tables. Yeah. Right. And they were dressed in white hotel suits and that sort of thing. Right, right. And when I looked at them, it, it didn't look like they were threatening to me. Mm-hmm. No personal threat. No personal threat. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's okay. Why? Well, because they were enforcers, as I think about it now. But they weren't personally threatening to me. Okay, thank you. Okay. The door. Open the door, and then boom, all these clothes. And as soon as mm -hmm. I saw all this clothes, I was, oh, you're in the clothing business. Mm-hmm. It kind of tickled me, because the next okay. day I went over to the Zen Stitcher. 
Yeah. <laughs> I have no idea. You're in the, you're in the clothing business. Yeah. And I said, oh, now I can, let, I can tell you a story that's going to make you realize that... Maybe I can have something in common. Then this allowed you to do what now? To share a story. To share, right. And to indicate that I understood, you know, that there was still an immigrant, you know, like there was that oh. sense in me of what, what this was about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you reveal that story. My great grandfather came from Canada. And I don't know whether I looked down the street and saw this, these monks coming mm -hmm. out of his house. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. I can't remember what, what sequence I saw that. I told him the story, but I remember I was part of the team somewhere. In that. Okay. But then I told him the story about the past, my great great grandfather. Okay. I think that I think the immigrant, I think the monk scene came afterwards. Fine. After I told that story. It's okay. Good. Okay. Good. Thank you. Notice, putting it into words again gives the person a chance to fill in, recall things. Very important. Right. Thank you for your help on that. Now, your job. Consider this. All right. You heard it. We have it sketched here. Do you notice any themes that repeat themselves? Let's label them. All right. A. B. C. We'll call this whole thing D. E. F. Okay. As you consider A, B, C, D, E, F. Fine. G. Any themes you see reappearing, repeating themselves? It doesn't here. Pardon? <laughs> I feel like the problem is because you don't belong here. There's some sort of fear. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. That appears. Okay. Good. 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 And then when he comes out and Good. He finds in the warehouse, in the closet in the warehouse, it seems like. He's trying to find a commonality with this person, and his fear is gone. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Good. More, more things. Any ideas? Come on. Once more. They're enforcers. The Buddhist monks are enforcers. Enforcers. Right. Enforcers. And even, even these guys are enforcers. Enforcers. Yeah. There was an application of. Pressure. Good, good, good. So we have that. Good. What else? Projections. Like the voice is projected and then the light is projected. Theater, projected. You're also using the idea of projection in that other sense, right? The voice is projected. Do you mean, and also on the hand? Yeah. Yeah, good. Good. And I think when he's trying Good. to communicate with those Asian guys, he has projected. Have to talk louder than the plane. Well, uh, he's trying to communicate with Asian uh, gangsters, for the court. He's trying to project what is to be an immigrant. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Okay. Um, any other comments? Okay. All right. All right. Suppose we look at this as a story. Would you agree, here is where it starts. You don't belong here. It gets worse. All right. Is he able to deal with that? Does he deal with it successfully? Does he get out of there? He leaves. So to that degree, all right, A and B, Wow, he reaches a success here, doesn't he? 
right? Avoiding, well, yes, he doesn't. He either had to fight it or leave. He chose to leave. All right. Okay. Now, um, A and B there are great threats, as was pointed out a short while ago. Do you notice what happens with D, E, and F? I'm not the subject of the threat. You're no longer the subject of the threat. The threat's over. All right. The enforcers are not enforcers. Spectator the first two, two scenes as well. That's right. My own hands. That's right. Passive. Wow, my own hands are like a screen. Whoa. Yeah. Uh -huh. My own hands are like a screen. Mm -hmm. Isn't that weird? Mm -hmm. Excuse me, I'm admiring this. I just saw this stuff. watching them being a spectator. That's what I'm thinking of. Mm -hmm. So there's our projection. Okay. Is, I'm a spectator. I'm sitting there okay. waiting for something yeah. to happen. Yeah. And it was a and then the image is projected on my own hands. Mm -hmm. oh. That's a funny relationship to have the one's hands. Okay. Why did it talk about this? Above his head. Why did it talk about this? I'm sitting like this, and it says, da 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 da. It was right, oh, it, it, right it, it went to my hand, you know? It went on my hand. Okay, it was where was the projector? Over my head, so it could project down on my hand. There was another projector in the movie house, of course. Like playing projector, playing the image of a projector. I'm telling you, the projector was right over my head. Very it was playing, weird playing the image of projecting. Your hand is a screen. It's it's right. My hand is not on my lap. And it's right near your head. If something were to project on your lap, where would it have to be? But it's coming from where? Right over head. Overhead. overhead. Is, that, is, this, is, there, is there some part of overhead you don't understand? No, I'm playing the word overhead. Huh? Yeah. Oh no no, it's just just up there. It's in it's in the ceiling. Okay. All right. That's so that's peculiar. That's peculiar, but it, but it, well, what I'm seeing is it makes it means because you uh, means up. No, that's fair. Look, look, see, you've got it. Now look, look here. Now we're going to do this. Consider A, B, C, D, E, F, G. All right. Consider it now as levels of intensity. All right. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And we're interested in two kinds. Right. Negative states. Most fearful. Where would it be? It would be in A and B. A and B? But, but, but not, not intense. Pardon me? But not intense. Not extreme. By okay. Means. Here. Yeah. I mean, Good. You know, All right. C. What happens at C? C. It's you leave. And that's still, it's still exciting, but, that, but it's not negative. But it's not negative. Yeah, it's All right. D. D. It's kind of like a, it, it's tense, but it's not. It's tense, but it does. I don't feel particularly threatened. Really. Okay. E. E. Uh, Clothes. Yeah. Whole warehouse. Yeah. The depth, well, that's the high. At that point, I get a sense of release when I see that whole thing full of clothes in the warehouse. And I go, whoa. Okay. Was, okay that was all uh, the high F, yeah. especially now I have something in common. Yeah. Yeah. What about it? I felt warmer. Warmer? It's kind of like. Uh, all right. G? G? I was dismayed. I mean, I could not understand that. And therefore, state of mind? Puzzle. Puzzle. Drop? Yeah. Somewhere. Right? Somewhere. It was puzzling to me. Okay. And then I had a very clear idea in my mind that they're the enforcers. Okay. They enforce something. I don't know what, I don't know why, but kind of. No. Okay. As you look at this, where would you say if there's a pivot, it turns, it switches? switches. Well, I decide to leave the theater. The One. The building, the Here. Building. Here. I decide to stand up beside the leaf. Right. Yeah, How about this one? Uh, when the door opens. When I have something in common? When I saw the clothing and realized I had something in common. I have a story I could share. We shared a story. Huh. And, oh, I remember now, and I was expecting him to be cynical about mm -hmm. the story I was mm -hmm. telling, but mm -hmm. he wasn't quite cynical. Mm -hmm. He wasn't cynical, he was listening. 
Mm -hmm. But then I saw these Buddhist monks going in and out of the house. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I did feel, how I, I, I understood what a Buddhist monk is, but I couldn't understand what he meant, so they're the enforcers. I mean, when, when, I, when that voice in my head said, oh, those, it wasn't like that was mm -hmm. coming to me, it was like a conclusion I was making, an insight I had when I saw it. Okay, now I'm going to go for one idea. Um, there are several key points. I'm going to go for this. Maybe I can have something in common. Notice the way on reflection, the way he described it. I can share. I can understand something now. I can share a story. That's interesting, isn't it? Like you can share a story. Mm -hmm. right? There's a theater, too, sharing stories. Um, now maybe I have something in common. Now I can share, I can tell a story. Um, what's the, what comes to your mind now about that? Sharing stories at home? shared story means that we share a story. That's when I can share a story or there's like a shared heritage. Yeah, talk more about it. Um, Come on. Shared inheritance. Then both. Just talk about it. Shared inheritance. Well, it's an immigrant story mm -hmm. from my father's side. Yeah. It's like, uh, oh. What did you come to? Oh, just I was con contrasting my father's story with my mother's story. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. In the last several weeks, I've, I've been rethinking my heritage a little bit because my dad dominated the family story, although my mother's family dominated my emotional life when I was one year, you know, first couple of years of my life. And I've been trying to piece back together who my mother's family was. And they go back to the 17th 16th, 17th century in the United States. In my father's story was that of the Jewish immigrant, the outsider. You're a Jew, you're an outsider. You don't really belong here. <laughs> you're different. And so, that's so. When there was, there, I mean, the time he sat down and told me about what it was to be a Jew, he said, no matter how far you, what you try to integrate, don't forget. You're always will be a Jew. Well, what the hell does that mean? And you're always an outsider. That's it. You can tell me any more. So mm. what does that mean? He goes, you'll see. Mm. That's it. How did he look at that time? Hmm? How did he look? Solomon. Solomon. Yeah, he was very wise. This was it. This was mm -hmm. You are an outsider. You'll always be an outsider. Go ahead, more. Come on, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Somewhat special, but the uh, outsider. Oh, so now you're right. This is a right. You're sharing a story. Yeah, and I'm also sharing outsider status. Right. And remember when you told the story, you said that uh, your grandfather made a great deal of money and your father lost it all. Mm -hmm. huh? Huh? Did you tell that to the... Yes? I didn't even realize. <laughs> I was going to tell my father's story here. And then I told my father's story in the dream. I forgot to connect. Forget, that's right. You told your father's story in the dream. Uh, I sold it and forget that I forgot. Okay. 
No, no, what does that mean? Say it again. Go on, say it again. Well, as you unpack the dream, and mm -hmm. I was just saying, well, what state of mind is to bring up? What is the story? To no. the story? And I was, I was thinking, well, the family story. This is the family story. Family story. It was dominated, it turned out by my father. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. You know, to, to, to hear my father's view of my mother's family, you'd think they were playing, you know, out of all, all cast out of the deliverance, you know? No, I don't. <laughs> no, no, I'll say it again. Hearted morons and idiots and inbred fools. I mean, that was my mother's side of the family to him. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't what they were. Yeah. But anyway, he dominated the family's yeah. tradition. Here's yeah. your tradition. No matter how, you know, Protestant your brother is, you're always Jewish. <laughs> yeah. No matter how Southern Baptist your brother is, no matter how Southern Baptist everything else is, and no how, no how Southern your accent might be, don't forget, you're always Jewish. Mm -hmm. Very kind of Jewish point of view. Classic. Okay, look, see. In the dream. <laughs> see, see, maybe I can have something in common to share with this immigrant. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And that puts you in a very interesting state. Yeah. All right. Remember? That was a high state. It was high. I had something in common with Yeah. Yeah. Well, I would say that they were like doing what the second or third generation of my fathers would be doing. I mean, mm -hmm. that was a big warehouse. That wasn't mm -hmm. a bush car. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, now that we have the, that image, and it's a very rich one, um, in terms of the dream then, you're in a high state, you're sharing it, you're sharing your understanding to this immigrant, mm -hmm. and you're telling him the story. Yeah, I'm telling, him, yeah, telling him about a progressive, you know, telling about the story. Right, right. Something of an American tragedy. Yeah, yeah. And behind it, when we explored it, we get these great statements, which I think you see some relationship between that and, yeah, and these. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's an interesting word you used. Uh, you picked it up nicely before. Uh, to talk about that word, would you? Enforcer? You know, I don't... Good word. Just talk about it. Enforcer. Just talk about it. They're like the immigrant policemen. They're like... I mean, they function like the policemen in the immigrant community. And, uh, I don't know. It's a mysterious word to me. I think I understand. I mean, I don't know why. I can give it. I, I, enforcer, what it means to me right now, it's just kind of, it's kind of like the gunman in the mafia. Yeah. Yeah. And but they don't constitute a personal threat in the dream. Right. The this is where the. And they're enforcers too. Uh, well, they are the enforcers, you uh -huh. said. Yeah, because I because all I do is just see those two thugs in the yeah. room. I don't right. say they're the enforcers. Right. Right. So what's what is going on here? Just stay with it now, because do you agree we have? A very nice statement about what it is. Yeah, and I could I can't reconcile that. It's a puzzle to me because how can you how can you call Buddhist monks? How can you liken Buddhist monks? Or how can you use the word respect to Buddhist monks? We we don't. Thank goodness we don't even have to worry about that. Okay. We can just stay with your dream. Okay. okay. Right. In terms of the dream, they are the enforcers. Yes. Right. And in, in pardon me? They're in the house. Not the house, or in a house. A big house down the road. Down the road. Okay. Put a state of mind on them, please. Huh? Put a state of mind on the monks, please. Calm. Calm. Okay. They are the enforcers. Go ahead. More? 
serious. More? Going about their business. And what's their business? Being... Enforcers. Being what Enfor else? Being what? Enforcers. Oh, that's okay. it's what you're doing. They're the enforcers. They're the enforcers. And they are in they are let's see now we have to raise to the level of the meaning, okay? Meaning. Difficult stuff. We just pull together what we've developed and give it back to the dreamer. Right. Um Sir, kind of interesting that um, if they are the enforcers then, and we see how the enforcers are, what they're doing in A and B, then the Buddhist monks are being the enforcers, and what are they saying to? I don't belong there. Oh. Uh, have you had a struggle with Buddhism? Mm -hmm. hmm. What do you make of it, if that's what's going on? Well, it seems as, see, it's like, one of the things I say, we use, use human beings for elbow grease. Yeah. I think it was the phrase was, we turned human beings into elbow grease. It was, because mm -hmm. I remember that the statement was made, it had something like, you know, with like, one of the, almost like those visions of hell, purgatorio, where people we were transformed into something. Yeah, I, I know, but you see. Okay. I can't change it, it's your dream. Okay. I have to stay with the words you use. I agree with you entirely, it would be a lot easier to understand if we could change it. We don't, we don't need to. Yeah. Now look here, the whole thing is going to rest on one word, and that's why it has to be in the dream. What does it mean with four, sir? Four. Not into. Uh, do Buddhist monks get into, as it were, elbow grease? Mm -hmm. Oh. Oh. But what uh, do you see about that? That's that, um, that word elbow grease, of course, has a history. Uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. I'm open for it. Go ahead. My mother's example, you know, put it to say, put elbow grease into it, oh. and they let me off the book. Mm. Or take She's... me out of the house, whatever her motive is. Oh, was. that's where she comes in. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, more, please. More what? Well, I mean. More elbow grease? Yeah. <laughs> all right. She got you to do all kinds of chores. Is that right? No. No? What did she do? I don't understand it. You she have got, to talk. She got me. She got me to run out of the house and stay away. No, I knew I didn't understand it. So I'm glad you're going to say more about it. Say it again. Uh, what kind of scene emerged? Could you, you know, give us one? The simple scene was I'm bored. I want something to do. And I, was, and I would ask my, you know, my mother to play. And to play. Okay, go ahead. And what did she say? She said, well, I'll give you something to do. And it was not play. It was yeah. a chore. Yeah. A tedious chore. Yeah. And a tedious chore. Elbow grease. That would require elbow grease. I see. I see. And then I would resist doing it. I wouldn't do it. And, uh, and then she would 
chased me out of the house, and I'd be glad to leave. By God, that's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, <clears throat> um, see, if they're using human beings for elbow grease, uh, you could either stay or leave. According to your mother's teachings, leave, you can leave. Why? Why? From what you just said. I think she wanted me out of the house. I mean, and just used uh, the pretext of work to get you out of the house? Yeah. I don't think she gave, gave a damn whether I did this bad stuff or not. No, it looks like she didn't. Uh, what would you say? It looks like she, she did looks like it? Oh, oh, oh. She because if she did? If she did, she would have had me do it. She probably oh, would have some oh, chores every oh, week. And, oh. uh, Kids would have been in a nice disciplined state. Yeah. Ah. She's certainly yeah, teaching you. Yeah, she's certainly teaching you how to work. She's teaching me. No, how no. To get the hell out of she's teaching me not to ask her to play. Or she's teaching me to keep to myself. Oh. To and, and to work and learn how to work at the family? Or? No, no. no. Sit in my room and mow. Yeah. 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 Now, um, that was helpful. Let's see whether we can push it one more step now. All right? Sure. Okay. Um, have you been in Buddhist places of houses of Buddhists, as it were? Yeah, yeah. Do they do this? Do they use monks for elbow grease? Do they put them to work? Mm -hmm. Oh. And uh, did you stay? Mm -hmm. Quite some time. Yeah. Then you didn't leave. That's rather interesting, isn't it? What was your attitude towards elbow grease or whatever that means in the well, Buddhist? I, well, I was working with my teacher. I thought it was a spiritual practice. Yeah. I thought it was a practice and I thought we were doing something noble. Yeah, yeah. Uh, was it? Did you? Yes. Then you achieved what you wanted? Or did you leave? What are you laughing for? I mean, let's tell us more. Come on. What's, what's the laugh doing there? now in your dream. What do you think about it? Well, uh, hmm. Does it look like on one side you have your mother's teaching and the other you have your father's? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Now is the part we need to focus, all right? Simple question. All right? 
Um, we've outlined different states of mind. You're very cooperative. You did a lot of nice work with us. As you consider the states of mind, especially this one, better leave, right? And there's also this, you're an outsider. Whenever you're doing a dream, the final question you must always deal with is why is it coming up now? Why is it coming up now? Do you find these states of mind coming up? When did you have the dream? Saturday night. Okay. On that preceding day? Uh, on Saturday night, mm -hmm. there was a party at uh, mm -hmm. the Philosophical Society, and uh, it was a really nice party, really a nice gathering. And I really felt comfortable. I was mm -hmm. having fun with this group that I had kind of a distance from mm -hmm. for a while. Mm -hmm. and that's the happening. And the question was kind of brought up, and the question was brought up, what would be the impact of this kind of philosophical mid life, this, this kind of dream work, on a global, political, global level? What, what could be the significance of it? It was an interesting question. I somehow intuitively feel that this, this dream came as a response to that question, because, because you, you suggested, you know, that, now that these questions have been asked, perhaps the Green Master is going to address it. Well, um, and, uh, were there states of mind? Mm -hmm. Were there states of mind that you can identify that were present at that gathering? The whole day, consider the whole day, that's all. We're now on the comparison. All right, we've gone right down through this, looked at themes, the struggle, looking at images and ideas. We're reflecting on it. Amplification, getting the person to say more about it in order to recover as much as we can. All right, we went through a search for states of mind, and now we're making comparison with everyday experience. That well, that's funny because uh I told my roommate that I maybe didn't want to go to the party because mm -hmm. I didn't feel like I belonged there. Oh, out. Same, same words. Mm -hmm. Outsider. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I felt somehow inferior to it. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, go ahead. What happened? I did go to the party, and uh, okay, that's that side. Now take this side, this side now. Okay. I did participate in the evening, and uh, it was very good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You see, the theme you have here developing um, is you found something in common: the family teaching. Right, your father was a father, failure. Father, right, father was a failure. Right, he lost all the money. Yeah, but there was a lineage. Yeah. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, the way in which you expressed that was like a shared inheritance. Remember? Right. So that when you were telling that story to the immigrant. Uh, you were telling him that in this sense, and when we asked you about the state of mind, it opened up into this re teachings of Father. Right? Yeah. Don't forget, you're an outsider, you are different, you're uh -huh. a Jew, always be a Jew, things like that. Um, so when you left the party, sir, what state of mind were you in? Good state of mind. I mean, I don't, I don't remember be, ever being in a closer state of mind or a better state of mind. Mm -hmm. It's in a good state of mind. Because you, you found that you found something in common? Yes. 
that's the high point uh -huh. right? now uh, there are so many interesting parallels but there's one part that doesn't fit and that's what we're staying on for a moment all right what we're what we don't see its relevance is this this story that was told within the dream um, and that's the last piece of oh, we did. okay there's an important state of mind that's associated with my depression all right uh, Especially with something I'm working with now, very consciously. Um, the uh, when I was telling the story, I was thinking about my great great grandfather, and that felt great. And I was thinking about my grandfather, and that felt even greater. And there was this really mm -hmm. nice thing. And then I was thinking about my father, and just a boom. It was like oh, pit in the stomach. It was like it was. I was starting to tell that part of the story. It was like. A, Oh, oh my oh. God, that's depressing. So that's the moment of depression, right? Depression, lost energy. That's the moment where I'm just, oh shit. <laughs> At that point, I say, and then, and, then, and then I said, and I inherit, and I'm building off of that. And I told one, and I said, mm -hmm. and I came out of that. I'm coming off of that. But it was when I was when I got to my father's role, my father's station. Let, let me ask. Like depression came in. Yeah. Okay. See that depression yeah. in the dream. All right. Now that you found something common, and now you may have to do something about it. Your inheritance is, as you perceive it, the cause of your depression and loss of energy. Yeah, there's some connection there. There's a connection. I don't mean to make it causal. Right. But there's a connection, isn't there? Yeah. Right. And the say you're successful through here. You're successful here. And I see their being successful. And their being they're successful. being successful because my great great family, you have a little push card and it's like yeah. if the line yeah. continued, it would have been yeah. a warehouse. So the 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 as you go through this, right, you're dealing with it effectively. But here's where you get now, we can say, okay. that's the... Yeah. That's the fall now. <laughs> that's the fall. Yeah. At well, that point, and, that, and I remember this painful when we talked about it. Uh, and at that point, I remember in the dream, going, feeling like a feeling less than, feeling inferior to, uh, feeling like a victim, feeling like I should receive something, you know, maybe this guy's going to get sympathy or something. Yeah, maybe I should receive something, Sympath yeah. right? Because you lost so much. No, Look it wasn't like no? that. No? Okay. It was a little different than that. I, I understand what you're thinking. Um, a little different no. than that. It's more like a... It was kind of like my sad, sad story at that point. I didn't, and I wasn't glad that I had a sad, sad story to tell. I wish I had a better story to tell. I felt guilty that yeah. I somehow okay. hadn't uh, cleaned up better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you see, you're climbing and doing good work, recovering, and that story and the way you understand. The story puts you in a depression, a loss of energy, guilty. And how, how does that then make you you're no longer effective? What price are you paying for identifying in this story? Your mind is showing you this, because isn't it? Enough, it's holding it up for yeah, you, isn't well, it? Looking at the first two generations of these touch bands in America, <laughs> I'm pretty proud of them. I mean, they really did something quite significant. And, uh, and I'm feeling, you know, as, as kind of a member of that lady, I'm feeling pretty happy. But then I talk about my father, and then it's kind of good. Yeah. In terms of this story, then, do you agree? What you're upset about is identifying with the loss, not what you're great-grandfather and grandfather did. Yeah, they, you're not identifying with them. You're identifying with the loss of your father. It's literally a dead beat. It's a missed beat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's the 
in terms of this dream and what you're relating to it is that this is the connection. Ooh, yeah. That's what you're paying for making that connection with your father. For always being a Jew? Well, with that teaching, you believed it. You believed it. The grandfather and your great-grandfather didn't believe it. Didn't believe what? That they're outsiders and they couldn't succeed. So look, there's a model. We become the copy. Look what this dream has done. Look, and now, certainly we might want to do more work on this, but would you agree we can say several things? The dream skillfully has chosen themes that he can relate to and on reflection he can link up to his own personal past. That the sayings and the statements have a whole history to them. Let's present it this way now, all right? This is his past. <clears throat> Let's work on an assumption. The assumption is <clears throat> whatever crafted the dream wants to send him a message. Here's the message. The message is you're paying a price for this identification. To tell him that message, he, from his own past comes all of these images, so the dream master has to pull out these images, knowing full well that there's a connection between each one of these images, which is what we got when we got him to reflect further and further, did we not? We were able to draw that from him. We were able to look at the themes that were developed, the themes were developed, there was a nice interesting division between the mother's side and the father's side and the crisis that occurred. And so the dream master then is weaving these things together like a tapestry of different threads and presenting a message, right? Which you can only get by reflecting on it, considering it over and again in terms of your own personal experience. Now, that was uh, quite interesting. It even brought in your past with the Buddhism and the fact that your spiritual teacher, the Buddhist, gave you a task and you thought it was, as you described it, absurd. And so you left on that, forgetting that it may in fact have been a spiritual exercise. Yeah. And so that cost you and your dream is giving that back to you to reflect upon and to look. Mm -hmm. And it's doing that with great efficiency, great skill. Now, <laughs> yeah. interestingly, interestingly enough, uh, my elbow grease worked uh, the day before, I, I, I got, I, I, I decided to start exercising. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a job I might want to apply for that's going to require that I be in physical condition. And I'm bicycling, mm -hmm. looking forward mm -hmm. to exercising and getting mm -hmm. strength. And uh, getting my strength. Gee, it wouldn't have had to have worked if your father hadn't lost all that money. Yeah, that's not true, but, uh, yeah, that's what it's like. That's what it's like. It's kind of like I have to be a manual laborer, a lower class person. Mm -hmm. uh, and, I, and I don't want to. She let you off the hook, didn't she? She never taught you to work? Nope. Wonder why? I don't know why. I can speculate, but I don't know why. Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. Let's see. That's going to entail a search and a reflection, but would, let's see whether we can pull some things together. Would you agree? The Dream Master selects these data from your personal past, can link them up together, can put them in terms of a story, can express states of mind, can use them to draw the implications into, the, into his present, like you just volunteered that very nice story about the fact that you now may have to do a little elbow grease and go out and do it. And I have been. Yeah, it's like yeah. It's, and I have been. I mean, yeah. for some reason I've been spontaneously doing things differently. I mean, I was just obviously clean, doing better cleaning up after myself. See, things like that. See, if that's the case, then your dream is telling you what you're hooked on, what you're holding to, clinging to. Now, this is a hypothesis. You know what you do with it? You note it and you watch the next series of dreams you have. If you're right, your dream master will give you dreams pushing the implications of that idea we just discussed and give you dreams that will demonstrate it dramatically so you can get greater insight into it. If we're wrong, the dream master will give you a dream that will, be in, that will focus in on another subject and you have to then follow that. So dreams occur, see, this is one, when you get a series of them, when you get a series of them, then you can then, after looking at each one, find the connection between each one. That gives you a sense that the mind is intelligible. Now, how much interpreting did I do through this? You don't need to interpret at all. Never interpret. Let the richness of a person's personal experience give it the color and the depth. Get the person to reflect. Get them to reflect on their own dream. Encourage them. You're a midwife. Don't add. It's their baby. You're going to help them come to birth. Right? Assist them. Back away often. Don't conclude too much. Right? Caution. Right? until at the very end if you want to then deal with the issue of dream series. That's the way you do it. So now look, what does this mean? Would you agree there's something in us that has influenced us deeply? It's when our parents or authorities appear most knowing, most virtuous, hey, sincere, knowing, trustworthy. Look at all those great virtues. Right. Caring, love. My father was giving me the roots. He was giving you the... He was transmitting the roots of my identity. Dharma succession, right? The very roots of your being. Yeah, to get this, what do you call it now? Curse. I don't know what, what do I call it. Did you say curse? That's why I said a curse. It could be a curse. Passed down from generation to generation to generation. That's right. That's right. That's what it could be. And there's only one person who can stop it, and that's you, in your own lifetime. But the only reason we have problems, if this is the case, is because we love seeing those we love appear knowing, virtuous, and caring for us. Never I mean, we're not, we're not evil, we're not driven by blind forces and that instincts. Was my father's love. I mean, that was it. That's it. That's showing love. Look here. You know what that does? That converts us to something that's primary. Look what it does. It brings each of us into a unity with the family. That's right. Right. Hey, it unites us to its cause. That's right. And you know what you get for it? A role. You get a role, you get a name, you get a heritage, you get a tradition, and you adapt to it. I got everything but the watch. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just throw it open for some questions, please. Thank you. First of all, thanks a lot for, for uh, volunteering.
Hi. How are you? What is it that creates belief? Then the conflict between the believer and the knower. What brings that dream to us? What brings that dream to us? Um, you see, if you let me add, add a couple of more things, then I can answer. Right? If it turns out that this dream or an analysis like it could help the gentleman, right? then would you agree the dream is then for his benefit? Therefore, whatever is fashioning the dream considers us personally, crafts a message out of our own past for our benefit. It opens up the past, it prepares us for, the, for, the, for our present. It can anticipate the future. It's pretty wise, isn't it? And the more you go into these, the more you're going to then add different key words to what it is that fashions the dream. And that's where we're going. Because let me give it to you very simply. This is, this is the lovely part of the whole evening, right? If we can show again and again that these dreams relate to something that you're going through right now, day before, a couple of days to come, then there's something in us that's aware, is it not, of all of this. There's something that's aware of our whole past, better than we are, right? It awakened all kinds of memories, did it not? Like, what we are consciously, let's call it consciously for the moment, all right? Or the image we have of ourselves. But there's something in us that's quite awake. And it means it's, you know what? It's tested. Like right now, there's something awake in all of us. And if you get in a bind or a difficulty being here tonight, or there's something you overlooked that's important and you should have heard it or picked it up, you might have a good dream tonight. Because that's what dreams do. They pick up things you've overlooked, things that are significant that you were ignoring. If that's the case, that means right now there's something that is more aware than we are. When we identify with our subjective feelings, we forget that there's something that's awake, which is quite wise and quite knowing, and always works for our benefit, right now. So, of course, the problem is, which one do you want to identify with? And the question is, apart from which one you want to identify with, by repeatedly playing this game, you'll see which one you do identify with. And that makes a big difference. Right? You're no longer that narrow thing that stumbles along, but you can enjoy your stumbling and learn from it, and learn from it. So what does it? Ah, we're going to have to put a name on it, and you're going to have to help. Yeah, do you have one now? It's a certain kind of knowing, like it doesn't do arithmetic. It doesn't do science. Intuition. Pardon me? Intuition. It's certainly very intuitive, isn't it? Oh, yes, I'd give it intuitive. Oh, yeah, high rank, high scores for in intuition. Sensibility, depth, creative, artistic, a master. And that's why I call it the dream master. Oh. Take a break. What do you think? Question? More? One? Two? Thank you for coming. I enjoyed doing it. Thank you. I need a cup of tea or a glass of water. Yes.
seemed like it was uh, remembering and describing, and you were recording mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and maybe filling in information. Mm -hmm. But then came a series mm -hmm. of questions that didn't seem to fit that mm -hmm. um, idea of following up on your narration. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't see a pattern to them, but they seemed to be very interesting, significant questions. And I wonder, um, are there questions that can help draw this to I'm sure. <laughs> If it worked, but I don't have I I don't know whether I could say I could I could list them. Um, I think it I think at first it's um, we have to stumble, but then there's a there really is you see one of the most intriguing aspects of this absolutely intriguing is try this now. Dream Master seems to be creative, profound. Caring, works to our benefit, artistic, dramatic, great flair for the dramatic, knows our states of mind. Uh, it appears to be, if this is related to our past, it's based on some analogical structure. If it has an impact on our present and future, again, it's taking the analogies or treating them analogically into the future. Therefore, to the degree to which you begin to understand this, then you're beginning to understand the way in which the dream master functions. That is to say, you're getting an insight into the mind of the dream master. Well, to that degree, you're becoming like the dream master. Right? Mm -hmm. Curious? And the reason I'm using that as an answer the more you play with it, the more you, in, you intuit that, that uh, there's just a great deal of integrity, incredible integrity to the dream, and you have to approach it and ask questions, back away, ask them again. And yes, there is a, yeah, I do have a, I've uh, developed a certain way of approaching dreams by certain sets of questions, but I don't know whether I could identify them before the next meeting so that we could all share them and use them. <laughs> <laughs> but if I can think of them, I will. Or maybe let, maybe we'll watch for them and I'll make a note of them. Skillful. Pardon me? They seem very skillful in this game. Yeah, yeah. Likely. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Can you give the dream master a task? Can you? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, can you give the dream master a task? Oh, yeah. Yeah, politely. Be polite. <laughs> Be polite. Bites. <laughs> Kick the dream master, it comes back and give you a nightmare. You should get some interesting data should yeah. not from this tape. You yes. should get some interesting data from this tape. Yeah, I mean we should make sure he gets the oh oh go back and listen to the recording to see the differences. Oh that would be splendid, wouldn't it? Oh yes. yeah. Yeah, to see where they're where they're especially the four. You know, just key words, you'll see. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. Good. Time for a cup of tea. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.